Um, how many of you are done with the podcast? You're going to be done. Okay. Um, so we've been, we've come a long way. We went from selective breeding to the kind of set of tools that go together, the restriction enzymes, the PCR, the electrophoresis, um, cloning. So before CRISPR even comes on the scene, we're to the point where um, transgenic organisms, which are popularly called GMOs, genetically modified organisms, which just means they've got a gene that their species didn't start with or that wasn't selectively bred into them. Even before 2015 with the onset of CRISPR, we're to a point where those are basically everywhere. Um, we started with bacteria. Obviously, I used the insulin example. Genentech, that's where it started. Um, animals, it's been done. Uh, there are mice that have almost complete human immune systems. What a great way to test, you know, how the human immune system will respond to something. Livestock with extra growth hormone genes spliced into their DNA, because of course every farmer's dream is to have their animal get big as fast as possible, so they can get more animals. Not all of this is pleasant. You know, industrial farming conditions, as some of you know, are often pretty awful. The way chickens are raised in particular is one of my least favorite in cages about as big as their bodies, all the cages stacked together. There's a risk they get so stir crazy that they peck each other to death. So they burn their beaks off sometimes like it's awful. And one of the things that happens to them because of the terrible conditions is they get diseases, especially salmonella. So Rather than fix those conditions, how about we just breed uh, salmonella resistant chicken? So they splice a salmonella resistant gene in there, and there you go. Good luck trying to maintain a GMO free diet at this point. Um, plant wise, crop wise, uh, the two, <coughs> yes, kind of by far the two most widely used crops would be corn and soybeans. And we're up to 92% of corn and 94% of soybeans grown in the United States being transgenic. Not that that is inherently a bad thing. We're talking about genes typically for things like um, pest resistance, Um, there's even plants that produce their own weed killer, but the most common in the first one was Roundup Ready plants, if you've ever heard of that. Roundup is a popular uh, weed killer, right? And so you can splice a gene into corn or soybeans or whatever that'll make it so that the Roundup doesn't kill them. It just kills all the weeds around them. It's convenient. We can make a glow in the dark cat, we can make a glow in the dark plant. That's been done. I don't know why. So it's everywhere. I mean, it's not, there's plenty of ethical questions, political sides. Um, but yeah, let's let's kind of fast forward to um what we thought was the next big thing. Um do we know much about viruses? Have we talked about viruses much? So they were kind of the, the first candidate for what's, what's going to be the next thing that changes genetic engineering. And uh, so viruses were kind of a natural choice. You don't have to write this. I just want to show you briefly a simplified virus life cycle. What viruses basically do, uh, and this is, this is simplified, there's a lot of different flavors of this, but what they basically do is attach to a host cell, inject their DNA, the DNA turns out to be a code for more virus parts. And your cell doesn't know the difference. 
DNA is DNA, right? So it takes the viral DNA, it's like, okay, I'll make those proteins. And those proteins turn out, turn out to be this stuff. This stuff kind of snaps together automatically, eventually pops the cell, and now you've got a billion viruses. That's bad, obviously, right? But viruses are really easy to mess with, especially the really simple ones. So the idea was, couldn't we, you know, if we want to change people's DNA, couldn't we program viruses to do it for us? And that's called gene therapy. Uh, and it's, you should write down. Um, so we kind of thought gene therapy was going to be the thing. Uh, using viruses to edit or at least insert new DNA. Um, and it, it does seem to work. These poor people who had probably spent their careers working on it. Um, in February of 2012, the first successful, a truly successful gene therapy was done. Um, and three women who are, had congenital blindness, maybe blind from birth, um, were able to see again. Amazing. Um, terrible timing because between 2012 and 2015 is when Doudna and Charpentier are doing their work on CRISPR. <laughs> so really kind of overshadowed this you know, considerable success. So what's better than having your own little tool to insert a helpful gene into a new cell? Uh, well, it turns out um, CRISPR, Cas9, is better. This is what it looks like, by the way. The one thing you can't get from the podcast. What it looks like is basically a, a little RNA machine. It's a little RNA machine that has a target sequence built into it. Um, as you know from the podcast, um, it's basically a natural immune system built into many bacteria, and it kind of just combs the bacterial plasmid, that sort of loop of bacterial DNA, combs the plasmid looking for bits of viral DNA that the bacterium has encountered before. That's how an immune system works, right? Is, is your immune system fights off things that it's seen before, that it's been exposed to. That's when it works best. That's why they call it this now, because it is viral DNA that the bacteria has experienced before. And when it finds that DNA, it clips it out. Not only does it clip it out, it's able to actually replace that DNA, that bad DNA, with good DNA. And down now, that when she learns all this, has the, the flexibility to go, oh, well, that looks like a pretty good tool. Like that looks like it's pretty easy to change that target sequence. And that it's probably pretty easy to change the new DNA that it slaps in there when it cuts out the target sequence. We could make that do anything we want. We could make it look for anything we want. We could make it stick in anything we want. We basically just got a DNA typewriter. So this is between 2012 and 2015 that all these breakthroughs are happening when they do successfully program CRISPR to do various things. And the possibilities are, I mean, it's, it's really, it's hard to overstate that you could use this to replace or edit any gene you want, turn any gene on or off without changing it. It's, it's big. I mean, we're only essentially five years in. There's already 
all the examples that you're going to hear in the podcast. Have you gotten to the gene drive part yet? You understand what a gene drive is? That's the one that is absolutely mind blowing and, and pretty scary. Maybe we'll talk about gene drive on Monday. I wanna see what you get out of the podcast. And if you've got, it's, it's, it's always been kind of hard for me to understand what a gene drive is. I think I'm there, but like, I wanna see how you do. I think they do a pretty, they do a better job than me probably of explaining it. So here we are, this is this, now we're in the present. CRISPR is absolutely exploding across the world. Um, and here's where we start to ask questions, right? We start to think, well, okay, if anything's possible, we have to decide what the things that are possible that we shouldn't do are, right? Like, where are the limits? Where do we draw the line? And this is why scientists around the world are having meetings and, you know, talking to lawmakers and there's all these conferences going on about like, geez, I mean, we got to legislate some stuff for limits on this or, you know, there's going to be some scary stuff happening. Um, so I have an assignment. I'm going to call it bioethics activity. What I'm basically going to do is give you um, a list. You know, don't write these. They're in the assignment. Um, I'm going to give you a list of things that are possible, things that are totally, this is not like the future, this is stuff we could do now. Um, sort of, they sort of go in increasing controversy, sort of, like the first one is maybe the least controversial and the last one is probably the most controversial, but I don't know, they might mix up a little bit. Um, and your job is basically going to just be to kind of find where your lines are. Which ones do you think are fine? Which ones do you think are, which ones do you think are only fine sometimes? In other words, like you shouldn't be allowed to do this except in these cases, right? Or which ones are like not okay at all, right? That's, that's what I want you to start thinking about. Um, I'm kind of conflicted on whether to give it to you today or Monday though. Uh, I think I'm going to make it due after the test, so due Wednesday, because you've got the podcast to finish. Um, I'm giving you sample essays, but they're fairly short. This is a pretty short chapter, so it's just one-sided. Let me give you these. These are due Monday. 